so delicious. It'll make you mm-hmm. good. or correspondence uh, specifically from any boards and the like that they might represent the town council on uh, which they would care to update us on some of their activities. Councilor Amaro. Yeah, I'd just like to report to the council that I did attend the National Association of Regional Councils Washington meeting last week uh, representing the Portland Regional Council of Governments and representing Cape Elizabeth. Uh, there were three of us in the delegation, Linda Abramson from Portland, John Walker, the executive director of COG, and myself. Uh, we spent all day Thursday on the Hill. We had a one-hour appointment with uh, Representative Joe Brennan. Uh, we had a half-hour appointment with uh, Senator Bill Cohen, and we had a five-minute appointment <laughs> with <laughs> Senator George Mitchell. But we felt very fortunate uh, to be able to meet with the new majority leader. Uh, in his new quarters, which were very impressive. All in all, it was uh, a really exciting couple of days down in Washington. Lots were uh, was happening. Everybody was excited about, uh, uh, in anticipation of President Bush's budget address uh, Thursday night. So we had a really good time. And I think we brought uh, to our congressional delegations the issues which are very much on all of our minds these days, which are property tax relief, affordable housing, uh, how can we build the infrastructure that we need in the greater Portland area uh, with very limited funds? And we ask them to please, please do not pass any more legislation unless they're going to fund it directly to the <laughs> municipalities. So that was, that was our, uh, our major message to our delegation down there. Thank you very much. Sounds like an excellent day to be down there as it the was. president was to give his address to Congress. Other reports and correspondence? Councilor George. Yeah, just one thing to kind of bring up to date as far as that committee that you so eagerly pushed me upon, the jail committee, studying for a new jail for Cumberland County. We have, we have been meeting pretty regular in this last week or so. We've been interviewing architects, engineers, and we narrowed it down to two, the committee did, and turned it over to the county commissioners in there to act on it, I believe, today. Good. Are there other reports of correspondence? Yes. Councilor yes. Krailman. Uh, Phyllis and I represented uh, Cape Elizabeth as delegates at the uh, Greater Portland Council of Governments General Assembly meeting on January 31st, 1989. <coughs> and I just wanted to let people know that um, a summary of the uh, growth management uh, findings entitled a local, regional, and state priority, a summary of sub regional forum results, is available. Uh, for anyone in the community that wants a copy, uh, one can obtain a copy either by calling 774-9891 uh, uh, or writing to the Greater Portland Council of Governments uh, at 233 Oxford Street in Portland. And only to echo uh, Jane's uh, earlier thoughts, uh, Jane being uh, the vice president uh, of this particular uh, executive group, the uh, executive committee and the legislative uh, advocacy committee identified four particular issues uh, for this legislative session, uh, including property tax relief, solid waste disposal, uh, affordable housing and growth management. Uh, all of these priorities uh, evolved from an evaluation of the region's needs <coughs> in the individual forums uh, and uh, coupled with the fact that uh, legislation has been filed uh, currently on all of these matters, uh, either by Governor McKernan or uh, legislative leaders. Uh, a motion was passed by the General Assembly uh, to accept and ratify these uh, priorities. And uh, it was really quite a moving uh, experience uh, being able to represent the, the citizens of Cape Elizabeth. And I would hope that anyone uh, who's interested in the particulars will again uh, request the summary <coughs> of the sub-regional forums. Thank you very much. Yes, Council Cogsell. Um, I am on the Thomas Jordan Trust Fund Study Committee, and I want to report that we're on schedule, and we will do definitely have our final recommendations by April 1st. Very good. Await those, for sure. <laughs> Should be interesting. 
Other reports and correspondence now. If not, I have two announcements that I'd like to make uh, at this time, which I guess would technically fall under reports and correspondence. On Tuesday, February 28th at 7.30 p.m. on Channel 38, we're going to be televising for the first time the orientation meeting for new members of town boards. And what, what I think is, is interesting about that for the general citizenry is two interesting things happen at this orientation meeting for new board members. One is, is council members and members of the administration, such as Michael McGovern and our town attorney, Tom Leahy, lay out to uh, these new board members as to exactly what are the functions of town council committees and how do the town boards fit into the schema of town government. The second important thing that I think is very interesting is every town chairman of every town committee, I mean every chairman of every town committee comes forward and explains about their committee and also talks about the important <coughs> topics that they've been talking about. So when you put it all together, what it is is, is an incredibly good sampler of Cape Elizabeth municipal government looked at in one program that I think has a really interesting format. It's not dry programming by any means. People uh, kind of keep it light and lively, keep it moving along, but it gives you a one snapshot look at how your town government functions from the council level on through to the board level and how it all connects. So I'd really urge you, I'm very excited about the fact that Channel 38 for the first time is going to be presenting this live and I'd urge you to, to mark down your calendars and, and note or even for your VCRs if you want to tape it for later watching which is Tuesday 7.30 p.m. Uh, Tuesday the uh, 28th of February. So please take note of that. The other important announcement is the town council as you probably know, has one of its main goals to improve and strengthen communication with our citizenry. Two things that have really helped us over the years in that line are cable television coming to Cape Elizabeth and our ability to broadcast meetings such as this, and also the Cape Courier, which I think has pr played a very important role over the last year in helping us communicate with you better. So in an effort to discuss issues that are on your mind, we're having two neighborhood meetings which are going to go, which the council is going to be leaving the chamber and going out into the neighborhood to meet in an informal setting with the citizens of Cape Elizabeth to discuss what's on your mind, to get feedback, positive feedback, negative feedback, concerns you may have, whatever it is, we'd like you to bring it to the two neighborhood meetings we'll be having. One is Thursday, March 9th at St. Uh, Albans Church at 7.30. The other is Thursday, March 16th at St. Bartholomew's Church at 7.30. There's many different topics that we can discuss, and, and just to run through a few of the hot ones over the last few years, open space preservation, the tax rate, affordable housing, Fort Williams and the Keeper's Quarters, development, the pace of development in the town, cable television committee, uh, the process by which town government works, all the things that when I go to the IGA I'm stopped and people are constantly uh, talking to me about, and I'm sure the other councilors are the same. So here's an opportunity to come and meet us in a much more informal setting than this so that we hope we can get some good dialogue and discussion going with the citizenry, especially since it <coughs> precedes the budget time and it will help us get some more direction in terms of where do we go with our, with our very significant and sizable budget that we have in this town. So we hope that you will make a note of those two times. You'll be getting a mailing regarding some more of the specifics on this, but keep watch for the neighborhood meetings that the town council is going to be happy to be conducting. <coughs> Lastly, in terms of a bit of correspondence that I would like to uh, read is a letter to Chief David Pickering, our police chief, from Michael Gray, who is the training supervisor of the Maine Criminal Justice Academy. And the letter read is, reads as follows. I'm very pleased to inform you that Andrew G. Steindl was recently elected president of the 61st Municipal County Basic Police School. The election of Officer Steindl by his peers indicates special leadership ability. This reflects credit upon Steindl as well as the Cape Elizabeth Police Department. Congratulations on the fine caliber of officer the Cape Elizabeth Police Department has entrusted the responsibility of providing police services. So to Officer Steindl, we wanted to congratulate you on being elected president and, and uh, tell you that we're all quite proud of this achievement and reflects well upon the town. Now, are there any other reports and correspondence? If not, I would move on to the next uh, point on our agenda, which is a resolution that I'm very proud to pre present this evening. And before I actually present it, I'd like to just make a few comments. Mary Webster, as many of you know, has been, is Cape Elizabeth's legislator in the Maine House of Representatives, and she's recently been elected to a leadership position as minority leader of the House of Representatives. I believe this is a testimony to her skills, to her ability to build and forge coalitions, and to the enthusiasm that she has for her job. So in light of her accomplishments, we passed a resolution that I would, at this time, like to present to Representative Webster, if you'd care to come down and meet me at the podium. Yeah, 
Yeah, we have a few special guests we'd like to have come up to the podium also. Come on. <laughs> Would you like to introduce the special guest, Mary? Yes, thank you. I'd like to introduce some special guests who have been very helpful to me and are going to make sure that I continue to do a good job for Cape Elizabeth. Nancy Webster, Marthy Webster, and Chance Webster. You can turn around. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of anticlimactic my reading this at this point. <laughs> no. Yes. The Cape Elizabeth Town Council resolution. Whereas Mary C. Webster has energetically represented the citizens of Cape Elizabeth for the last four years in the main House of Representatives, and whereas Representative Webster has ably served our citizens as a town council member for six years, and whereas her recent election as the House Republican leader is indicative of the high re regard her peers have for her, and whereas the Town Council is proud of Representative Webster, and we wish to convey our appreciation for her continuing close contacts with our municipal government, therefore be it resolved by the Cape Elizabeth Town Council and Town Council Assembled, does hereby congratulate Mary C. Webster on her election as leader of her party in the main house, and we wish her well as she assumes her new responsibilities. Dated on this day, Cape Elizabeth, Maine. So, Mary, congratulations on your position. Best of luck. I used to serve on the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. I was first elected more than 10 years ago in 1978. Bill Jordan was on the council at that time, and Henry Adams, who's also here, was my first town council chairman. In those days, things were much less formal than they are today. We didn't have microphones. We didn't have uh, television. We didn't have the big blue backdrop. Uh, and probably we didn't have to work as hard as all of you have to work today. But I appreciate the confidence that you have shown in me. I hope to continue to be able to keep uh, close communications with you on issues that um, affect Cape Elizabeth and the legislature. And I appreciate the confidence that all of you have shown to send me up to Augusta. It's something that I enjoy very much and I enjoy doing um, on all of your behalf. And I also have to say I really appreciate the uh, support I've had m from my own family to do this. It does take a lot of time if you're going to do it well, and they've been very encouraging to me all the way along. So thank you very much, all of you. Appreciate it. The next item that we have this evening is uh, reports from the Arts, Arts Commission. Every month we have been having a different representative from a different <coughs> town board or commission come forward to kind of update us as to what's been happening with that town board or commission. And this, this whole thing is an effort to continue to have cl close communication between the town council who appoints these commissions and the boards themselves and the work that they're, that they're carrying out. So this evening we have Polly Morrison who is here from the Cape Arts Commission who is going to be presenting, uh, rep just talking a little bit about what that board has been doing of late. Polly is here, could she come forward? If any representative of the Arts Council is here, would they like to come forward? If not, we'll look forward to their report next month. <laughs> this is what's known as ad-libbing. <laughs> Very brief report, but to the point. Okay, we'll start this evening's formal agenda by a public hearing regarding fish and farm market ordinances. And as the uh, chairman of the Ordinance Committee couldn't be with us this evening, we have a representative of the Ordinance Committee, Councilor Cogshell, that will be reporting on this. Okay, first of all, I especially want the students to realize that this has been a very long process that um, has taken almost two years to get to this stage, starting with um, a couple of appeals before the Board of Zoning Appeals and references to the planning board that we need to clarify um, areas of our ordinance that deal with farm and fish markets, definitions that we're lacking, and since one of the primary historical focuses of the town is farming and fish, fishing, um, that we should have um, ordinances that clearly take a position to support them and make them basically legal. In some instances, they weren't even legal in the town. So if you will bear with me, the planning board, um, under the chairmanship of Alice Rand, appointed a special committee to deal with this particular <coughs> development of this particular ordinance. It was chaired by um, Dick Tinsman and had members of the planning board, the zoning board, 
farming community and the fishing community and had um, a, about six months worth of work before they came up with an acceptable draft which was um, studied by the planning board then brought to the town council referred to the ordinance committee and now has come back for a public hearing it's quite extensive so bear with me as I go over the, um, the corrections and additions we will in under definitions of section 1913 under B accessory buildings or use delete the term roadside stand what we will add is a definition of farm and fish market a temporary open stand as well we'll amend section 1913 under definitions by adding the three following definitions and relettering agriculture agriculture is the cultivation of the soil for food products or other useful or valuable growth of the field garden or nursery but does not include animal husbandry a definition of farm market a definition for fish market a definition for related market products and a, t a partial listing not limited but including prepared or processed food products packaged non-alcoholic beverages handicrafts and Christmas wreaths Christmas trees and garlands we will amend section 1922 resident a district by deleting roadside stands as an accessory building or use and by adding farm and fish markets meeting the definition of home occupation as an accessory use add farm and fish markets as permitted uses as follows new letter M farm markets and fish markets as defined in this ordinance providing said markets may only be placed on lots which satisfy the then current minimum lot size minimum street frontage and other applicable space and bulk requirements and further provided that the following criteria are met section one the minimum side and rear setbacks required for a farm or fish market are 50 feet and the min minimum front yard setback required is 100 feet two off street parking shall be provided of at least one space per 150 square feet or major fraction thereof of the retail sales area of the structure the required parking area shall be gravel or paved and striped as determined by the planning board based upon traffic safety or environmental protection concerns an area for off street parking to accommodate overflow parking shall be provided at least one space per 250 square feet or any fraction thereof of the retail sales area of the structure the overflow parking area shall be suitable for parking but need not be improved with pavement or gravel new subsection three off street parking may extend into the required front yard by no more than 50 feet from the front yard setback line and off street parking shall not be located within the rear yard setbacks subsection four maximum maximum floor area for retail sales of products shall not exceed 2,000 square feet subsection 5 outside storage and displays shall not be located within the above required setbacks subsection 6 signs shall meet all applicable applicable regulations and shall not be located within the above required site setbacks subsection 7 farm and fish markets excluding those markets defined as home occupation shall require planning board review and approval of the site plan new small letter n any building or use customarily accessory to those above provided however farm and fish markets meeting the definition of a home occupation shall, re shall require zoning board of appeals approval under section 19314 as may be amended <coughs> we'll amend section 1922 resident a district to reletter the permitted uses you amend section 1923 <coughs> subsection a resident c district by deleting roadside stands as an accessory building the requirements are basically the same as in subs, um, residential a 
Amend section 1931, subsection B, setbacks, the fourth paragraph, to delete the following. Street setbacks shall be measured from the right of way line. That's as proposed. Thank you very much, Council. I would like to now open for public comment the proposed changes in our ordinances regarding fish and farm markets. Is there anyone in the audience who would care to come forward to comment on this? As, as has been mentioned, it has been a long process, and now we are at the public hearing stage. Uh, as has just been outlined, if there's any comments that anyone would care to make, now would be the appropriate time to come forward. If you could just uh, give your name and address also. All right, the podium, we appreciate it. My name is Bill Bamford. I live at uh, 112 Spur Inc. Avenue. I work for Maxwell's Farm. Uh, Ken Maxwell could not be here tonight. He's out of town, so he wrote a letter and asked that I read it on his behalf. It's addressed to the town council concerning the fish and farm market ordinance change. I would like to give my support for the proposed changes and ask that they be adopted. I was privileged to serve on the committee that proposed these changes, and they did not come easy. I believe this will give the local farmers and fishermen a way that they can sell their products while still giving the town reasonable control. As most of you know, I have been working a year to get approval for my farm market. I still do not have it as yet. I feel the proposed changes will make it easier for other farmers should they desire to do the same. In closing, I would like to remind the council and the town as a whole that the greatest benefit of all will be the free open <coughs> space that these farmers will provide. Yours truly, Kenneth L. Maxwell. Thank you very much. Other public comments regarding the fish and farm market ordinance changes that we have? If there are no further comments, I would then close the public hearing part of this uh, meeting and move on to item 90, which is to consider public hearing comments on proposed amendments to the <coughs> Code of Ordinances regarding the fish and farm markets and take any necessary action, which is the time where we now have discussion amongst the council and possibly take a vote on what we just had a public hearing on. So, are there any comments from the fellow councilors? Any? Yes. I, I move that we um, approve the changes in the ordinance as presented. Second. second. So, we moved and seconded to approve the uh, changes as presented. I, I would just comment myself that, uh, as was pointed out earlier, 25% of the floor space could be used for market-related products, which means the, the different things that were listed here are uh, processed foods or packaged non-alcoholic beverages. The remaining 75% must be used for produce or fish, depending on the different building. Within that 75%, however, there's no mention as to real specifics of how much of that food must be grown in Cape Elizabeth, which, at the last meeting, uh, concern me in terms of it not being extremely enough for, for my likes, but after having talked it out with some people, I feel that this is, is still an applicable uh, ordinance change, and I do think that we have the ability to uh, properly manage it such that we understand that the intent is, as is listed on page one, which is the farm market is operated primarily for the purpose of selling raw agricultural products grown upon a minimum of 10 acres of agricultural land within Cape Elizabeth. What I'm getting at is I just don't want to see this turn into a bunch of mini convenience stores that open up to sell a lot of out-of-state vegetables. That's not the point of it. It's to be able to have Cape Elizabeth people buy food grown by Cape Elizabeth farmers grown here in Cape Elizabeth. And as long as those that are enforcing the law understand that's the intent behind it, I think we'll all be in, in good shape as far as I'm concerned philosophically with this ordinance as it's written. So that's the only comment I want to make. Any other further comments? If not, all those in favor of the ordinance changes as proposed? Any opposed? Mine so passes unanimously six to zero. Yes, Council Commission. Um, this was brought up one of our earlier discussions um, that a letter be written to the Board of Zoning Appeals as to the intent of the home occupation um, section of the ordinance as if we hope will be amended, but currently as is written. Noted. We have another public hearing now, and this is for housing uh, for the elderly ordinance, which we are also going to be discussing this night. We have another member of the ordinance, Mr. Jordan, who's going to be giving a brief presentation to, to fill us in on this ordinance. Mr. Jordan. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> you see they pass it on to the elderly. <coughs> Housing for the elderly ordinance language, it's the ninth draft, and the, we've been going around on this for a couple of years, and I think it's a part of this ordinance is something that's, that is needed for elderly people. And, it, uh, and I'll brush through it a little bit. If you have any other questions, the town attorney's here, and there's other people. And uh, they've added and re-lettered and practically ch done a lot of changes with the old ordinance. And it speaks of boarding care facilities, which is an uh, operating of a boarding house that has uh, standards that it has to go through. The key to it, in my opinion, is a congregate care housing. And this congregate care housing is for elderly people that are living alone and, and uh, really shouldn't be, and they can move into a place and be pretty much on their own, and they're sure to get at least one free one meal a day. I was ready to say free, but I guess it wouldn't be free if they get in there. And uh, this is the reason that we went through and rearranged this whole ordinance, because uh, congregate care facilities weren't uh, mentioned clearly in the previous ordinance. So it is pretty pretty much uh, rewritten. And then you go on to uh, continued, continuing care in retirement community, <coughs> a residential care facility that provides a combination of a nursing home and congregate care housing service as defined herein. Then it goes on and defines what uh, congregate care is and uh, nursing home, and I'll just hit the high points of it as I go along, as I hit a couple of things here. And what they have to provide it is like passive recreation, like walking areas, picnic areas, hiking, and what have you around the facilities. And then they have their support facilities. And we move on to um, a section that was deleted, which was nursing home, and uh, was re redone. And what was deleted is nursing home, home for the age, subject to the approval of the zoning board, site plan review, and approved by the planning board is required. And that it was all deleted because it was pretty vague in, in uh, the way the previous ordinance read. And uh, I would say, almost say the key to it, and a lot of the discussion was hung around in congregate care facilities is you could have six units per acre. And uh, nursing home, you're allowed six nursing home beds per acre of residential acre. And uh, this was one of the keys, I think, that took some time to find out whether what was viable or not. And then the minimum lot size, the minimum lot area shall be 20 acres for congregate care housing and continued care, continuing care retirement community, and five acres for a nursing home. So it defines how many acres that anyone needs to, uh, to uh, build their facilities. And then you have your setbacks, you have your heights that you can have, and uh, you can't go way up in the air, as the fellow might say. And uh, <coughs> then it requires so much open space around the facility and the buffers. And I think it is a pretty good ordinance, and I would hope that uh, the members of the council will pass it as it has been rewritten. That's all I have. Thank you, Councillor. I would now like to open it up to, for a public hearing regarding the housing for the elderly ordinance that we have before us this evening in the packet. Is there anyone that would care to come forward to make any comments regarding these amendments to our ordinance? No one would care to come forward. If not, I would close the public hearing portion and move on to item number 91, which is to consider public hearing comments on proposed amendments to the code of ordinance regarding housing for the elderly and take any necessary action. Yes, Councilor. Uh, I, would, <coughs> I would move to adopt the proposed amendments to the zoning ordinance relating uh, to housing for the elderly <coughs> as contained in the uh, just read ninth draft dated January 5th, 1989. Second of all. It's been moved and seconded to adopt the uh, ordinances. Is there any further comments that any of the councils would care to make regarding this? If not, I have a comment as usual. <laughs> I'd like to underline section H, 
which reads, for those that didn't uh, pick it up for Councilor Jordan's uh, synopsis, reserved units, the planning board may require that a congregate housing or nursing home facility give a priority to Cape Elizabeth residents or immediate family members thereof on any waiting list for entrance to the proposed facility. And I'll again refer back to a very important uh, workshop that we had where we met with numerous members of the council and other town boards where we discussed a little bit the uh, whole situation of housing for the elderly and health care for the elderly. And the only thing I want to underline is that I hope as we continue to define policy that we look at meeting the needs of our own Cape residents of varying economic backgrounds, middle income, low income, as well as those that can afford uh, the top care. I think this is the challenge for government and private sector over the next decade, and I hope we as the elected officials can meet that challenge. So that's, that's how I feel very strongly about Section H of this ordinance. Any, are there any other comments anyone care to make? If not, all those in favor of the proposed ordinance changes, please raise your hand. Any opposed? No, so it passes unanimously six to zero. We have our third and final public hearing for the evening, which is on sewer connection in wetland area <laughs> and in 100 year floodplain. Did it get you? <laughs> it's a good thing I ducked. <laughs> Councillor, Councillor Cogsell would like to make that synopsis of uh, that ordinance. And the light just went out. Would you like to come over here where it's brighter so you can read your notes? Here, yes. I wish it had been that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, we as a, as, a, as a council are rather um, <clears throat> late in accepting this particular ordinance which was required in 1977 by the uh, Jimmy Carter administration and deals with any kind of sewer connections in wetlands <coughs> that have any federal funds involved. I understand that the Portland Water District is being question as to whether or not we have such an, an ordinance in place since our southern um, treatment system has federal funds, um, both by their auditors and by the Environmental Protection Association. So we thought that it would be best that we make this recommendation now. <clears throat> and it is under Section 662 application, a new subsection I. If the building or other construction is to discharge wastewater into any collection line, lateral sewer, interceptor, or other means of conveying wastewater to the Southern Cape Elizabeth treatment facilities, sufficient information must be provided to show that the building or the construction is not located within the wetland area within the meaning of Executive Order 11990 for the protection of wetlands nor within the 100-year flood boundary shown on the Southern Cape Elizabeth Hazard Boundary Map issued through the National Flood Insurance Program. A change in subsection 15.14a, a new section 2. It shall be unlawful for any person to discharge wastewater into any collection line, lateral sewer, interceptor, or other means of conveying wastewater to the town treatment facilities if such wastewater originates from any building facility or other manner of construction which is erected or otherwise placed on or after the effective date of this <coughs> ordinance in whole or part upon land which is defined as wetland area within the meaning of executive order 11990 for the protection of wetlands or is located within the 100-year flood boundaries shown on the Southern Cape Elizabeth Hazard Boundary Map issued through the National Flood Insurance Program. Under Section 1939, <clears throat> under Wetlands Code, under D standards, a new subsection 6, <clears throat> which reads, will be accomplished without discharging wastewater from buildings for other construction into the Southern Cape Elizabeth treatment facility in violation of sex, section 1514 of the Cape Elizabeth sewer code. Those are the changes, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Councillor. Is there anyone that would like to come forward to discuss <coughs> the proposed changes in the ordinance as has just been outlined regarding sewer connection in wetland areas in the 100-year floodplain? Last chance to talk on this exciting topic. No one? 
I would hereby then close the public hearing portion and would move on to item 92, which is to consider public hearing comments on the proposed amendments to the Code of Ordinance regarding sewer connections in wetlands and within the 100-year floodplain and take any necessary action. Any comments uh, by my fellow councilors? Council Cogsio? I move that we accept the ordinance changes <coughs> as presented. Second. It's been moved and seconded to um, adopt the ordinance changes as they've been proposed. Council Jordan. Just one comment, and it's kind of a comment I used when we was working on the ordinance. Evidently in Georgia they don't run water into the houses, they just run it out, so this is a problem. But in Cape Elizabeth, as I interpret this, you could run the water in, but you can't run it out through the wetlands. An interesting dilemma. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments? <laughs> Seeing none, all Thank those, you, yes, oh, sorry, excuse me, Council Greenlaw. For the record, I would like to say that we had asked the town manager to notify property owners whom could be identified as being affected by this ordinance, and I would like to say that this notification does not preclude the applicability of this ordinance to any other property now or in the future. Very good. It is so stated on the record. Other comments? If there are none, all those in favor of the ordinance changes, please raise your hand. Any opposed? It passes unanimously six to zero. We're moving on now to item number 93, which is to consider a report from the appointments committee regarding vacancies on town boards, commissions, and committees, and to take any necessary action. And I would have a report from our very able chairman of the appointments committee, Councilor Amaral. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> once again, it has been a real pleasure to chair the Appointments Committee, uh, and I want to thank Wayne Creelman and Janet Greenlaw for serving so well. Uh, once again, we had many more applicants for committees and uh, for boards and commissions than we had spaces available. Uh, we asked everyone who was interested to come in for a, an interview, and every person did, and we really want to thank all of you who could come in. We, the three of us enjoyed meeting some lots of new people and talking to uh, many uh, old faces. I'd just like to tell you a little bit about the dilemma that we did experience. Uh, Fifteen people uh, showed an interest in serving on the Fort Williams Committee this year. There were two openings on that committee. I must say that each one of the 15 people who showed an interest could serve very well in that committee, were very well qualified and would have been an asset to that committee. And it was a real dilemma for us to try to uh, choose from uh, a pool of people that strong and that many. Uh, what we did do was to look at each committee, and I'll use the Fort Williams Committee as an example, uh, to see uh, who the present members of the committee were, what parts of town they lived in, uh, what groups they might be representing, uh, whether they had young families or whether uh, they had lots of maturity and experience. We were trying to really balance uh, each of the committees, and I think it's a real luxury that we had so many people express an interest that we were able to do that. And I think we have um, some outstanding appointments to recommend to the council tonight. Uh, I, I want to uh, just mention, for the people who did apply and did show such a strong interest and who we were not able to place on the committee uh, at this particular time, please don't give up. Uh, reapply. In fact, later on tonight, we are going to be talking about the possibility of setting up another uh, committee which will uh, last for about a year and a half uh, and which will have one specific task assigned to it. So for you people who, who want to do something for your community uh, in another capacity, that opportunity will be open too. Okay, uh, with that, these are the recommendations coming from the Appointments Committee. <coughs> For the Area Development Council, Carla Nixon. For the Planning Board for a five-year term, Marion Guthrie. Planning Board Associate, which is a one-year term, Judith Wyman. And Planning Board Associate, another one-year term, Joel Russ. For the Zoning Board, a full three-year term, Howard Wolgen. Uh, zoning Board Associates, there are two of them and they are one-year terms, Robert Cronin and Nancy Sanger. For the Board of Health, Christine Thurber-Irwin. 
for the Board of Assessment Review, a three-year term David Scheffler, the Conservation Commission, which is a five-year term John Roberts, the Riverside Cemetery Trustees, Diane Chevenel for a three-year term, and Ray Hutchinson to fulfill the unexpired term of Frank Ferraro, and that would be two years remaining on that term. The Thomas Memorial Library Trustees, uh, two positions, three-year terms, Mary Ann Lynch and Joseph Johnson, Jr. Community Services Advisory Board, Don Roy. Cable Television Advisory Board, a one-year term, George Dunn. Three-year terms, Richard Nest, Randall Wheel, and David Blazier. For the Fort Williams Advisory Commission, uh, three-year term. Oh, I'm sorry. Jeff Monroe replacing Dave Glazier, whose term expired on the Cable Television Advisory Board. Thank you. The Fort Williams Advisory Commission, Richard Walker and Carolyn Smith. The Board of, of Historic Preservation Advisors, uh, Robert Agan and Nancy Harvey. The Arts Commission, there are three, three positions there. Steve Micheletti, Lois Taranjo, and Polly Morrison. And the Board of Sewer Appeals, <coughs> two positions there, Carl Pearson and Stephen Etzel. And the Personnel Appeals Board, Gordon Davis. And with that, I'd like to, to move that uh, those names, which I've just read, uh, be, the, be appointed to the various boards and commissions. Second motion. It's been moved and seconded. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman, for reading that list. Any discussion on this agenda item? Just one yes. further comment. I would like to thank our town clerk, Debbie Pizzo, who uh, staffed uh, our committee this, this year and made all of the phone calls, made all the arrangements for us, and made it very easy for, for us uh, three counselors to carry on with uh, the interviews. Very good. Any further discussion of this item? If not, all those in favor of the appointments as have been read by the Chairman of the Appointments Committee, please raise your hand. Any opposed? So it passes six to nothing, and thank you all once again for coming forward. And as Jane said, I can back that up being on the Appointments Committee last year. Please don't, don't give up. Keep trying in future years because we do have a turnover every year. So thank you so much for volunteering your time. We're moving on now to item number 94, which is to consider a preliminary report from the Fort Williams Advisory Commission on the Lighthouse Keeper's Quarters at the Portland Headlight and take any necessary action. I'm sure most of you by now are certainly aware of the fact that the Town Council has asked the Fort Williams Advisory Committee to give us a report on possible uses for the Keeper's Quarters now that it has been announced that the Coast Guard will be turning those quarters and the uh, surrounding acreage over to the town of Cape Elizabeth. Uh, we have. What we're having tonight is the Fort Williams Advisory giving to the Town Council, which we have in our packets in front of us and have had time over the weekend to digest the preliminary report, not the final report, but a preliminary report, uh, at pretty much of a progress report as to how they're coming along on this, on this item. We have with us this evening numerous members of the Fort Williams Advisory Committee and the chairman of the Fort Williams Advisory Committee, Henry Adams, that I would now invite to come to the podium and tell us what's happening. Thank you very much, Frank. Uh, all of you have uh, received item 94 in your packets, which is the uh, report, the preliminary report of the Fort Williams Advisory Commission, which delineates our progress to date. And it says there, although there is still much work to be done, we have made substantial progress in gathering relevant information and making some preliminary decisions. Now, this report that you have is in two parts. The first section is a project plan that we developed in November after we received the charge from the Town Council. And it was developed to guide us in our work. And the second part of the report is uh, the report of the status to date. And it's organized in the same format as the uh, preliminary plan. But I'd like to digress for a moment and, and tell you, you know, the report that you have in front of you is our independent study of a task that you people have assigned us uh, to do. And I think it's in the fine traditions of the town of Cape Elizabeth uh, that 
the council, you know, when they do have problems, uh, forms a study committee, allows them to uh, proceed and take their time and develop a, a plan. And when the plan is done, uh, I know <coughs> that from previous experience on other boards and commissions that the plan is complete and uh, represents the best interest of the town. But because this process involving the keeper's quarters is so involved, uh, it's going to be well into the fall before a final report is ready. Uh, but in the meantime, we felt that uh, at least uh, we ought to update the council on our progress to date. Now, as I explained before when I was uh, reviewing the Fort Williams Advisory Commission uh, in one of those pre-council uh, sessions, uh, we divided the Fort Williams Advisory Commission up into subgroups. Jim Cox was in charge of, uh, of uh, the security aspects of Fort Williams and the Keeper's Quarters. Uh, Ann Kerner and Art Hahn uh, were sort of assigned the subject of entrance fees. Uh, Joan Ralston uh, was given the budget items that we have, which are tree trimming to the bleachers, to the grills, to the picnic tables, and what have you. And Nancy Jackson and Clint Blood were given the responsibility for uh, beginning work on the keeper's quarters. Uh, and what we have done, and what we did in November was to develop an outline for us to follow. Now, Nancy Jackson uh, put all of this into her uh, word processor. And uh, as we discussed each of the items during our many, many meetings, uh, she went back and fleshed out each one of these subjects so that uh, the report you have in front of you tonight is the result of uh, Nancy Jackson's work. And uh, I just want to take a moment and publicly commend her for the preparation of the report. I think it's a tremendous job. And uh, it, uh, I just hope your computer, like others, doesn't uh, break down. Uh, the, also, I'd like to say that the details of this preliminary report are unanimous. If you go to the next page, uh, under item C, it lists nine major tasks that we identified that we felt that we had to, uh, to look at. And number eight said to develop preliminary report for the town council by late January. As I told Clint Blood, this is about as late in January as you can get. So uh, the next item, which I want to review with you, are, is item D, preliminary assumptions and limitations. Number one, the co a Coast Guard or Maritime Museum or historical exhibit is one of the uses to be explored. All uses considered will be nonprofit as required by the Coast Guard. All uses will be consistent with the Fort Williams policy. And the Fort Williams Advisory Commission will not run the museum or any function or raise funds or manage the facility directly. But the role of the commission is to select a function and its supporting group based on the desirability of the function and the ability of the support group to manage it. Then we have listed, as you can see, uh, a bunch of tasks that we felt that we, we must address. Now, if you go to uh, two pages and get into the preliminary report, uh, I'd like to, if you're all there, on uh, <coughs> item C, major tasks. Uh, we identified 13 major tasks that uh, uh, had to be uh, addressed. And we got these from various sources through the public forum that we held on uh, November 17th, from the 21 letters from residents that we received, ideas from commission members, and from other miscellaneous sources. And I'll just run down these to, so that the, everyone will uh, realize the things we've been looking at. A National Lighthouse Museum, a local historical exhibit, including Fort Williams items, a uh, period restoration exhibit, Coast Guard Museum, a daycare center, senior citizen center, conference facilities for the town and for rental, housing for a member of the police or the, and or the park ranger or the manager or somebody else, uh, rental housing, uh, rent to a citizen on a weekly basis if they want to have a getaway weekend and uh, peer at all the people that are peering in the windows, uh, a gift shop, a consignment shop for crafts or operators as, as an inn. So uh, if you turn the next page, uh, you'll see that uh, we have examined all of those uh, 13 items. And right now, we are actively uh, looking at item B, C, and D, the local historical exhibit, the Coast Guard Museum, and a period restoration exhibit. And we are 
possibly giving consideration to H and G, which are the conference facilities and the, uh, uh, some type of housing. Uh, we have eliminated uh, from our dis consideration such things as a gift shop, uh, rental housing, a consignment shop, and so forth. And we have eliminated from our discussion uh, any consideration of a National Lighthouse Museum. Uh, it was rejected, if you remember, uh, rather uh, loudly by the public forum we held on the 17th of November, and also by the citizens who wrote to the Fort Williams Advisory Commission. The concerns cited included increased traffic in general, especially by tour buses, which have already become a concern to pedestrians using the park. Uh, around the 29th to the 28th of uh, November, there was a distressing newspaper article and in some interview that was held with uh, a, a, the chairman of the Lighthouse Preservation Society in Rockport. And uh, I did call up there on the morning of November 30th and uh, told them that if they had any information and there any presentation they would like to make for the Fort Wins Advisory Commission concerning a National Lighthouse Museum, uh, we'd be glad to hear from them. Uh, so they uh, commissioned their agent in Maine, George Schnacke, who was the president of uh, Trident Associates, to represent them. And he did come and talk to the, uh, Port, uh, to the Fort Wins Advisory Commission. He did say that uh, Portland Headlight, as it stands now, the keeper's quarters, were too small for a national museum uh, because of the fact there would have to be a library, a great research center, and conference facilities. And furthermore, he stated that uh, there must be a desire for the community to want it. And uh, the overwhelming feedback to date, of course, has been opposed to a national museum. And given these factors and the rest of his discussion, uh, we decided that uh, uh, we would give it no further consideration. And the gist of George Schnucky's presentation was that they, the Lighthouse Preservation Society was backing away uh, somewhat from a Portland head. Uh, they, they did say that it would take over two years to uh, get any type of a museum uh, going. There had to be a group of people who would be interested in doing it. Uh, so that uh, uh, he felt that if we got going and we needed any technical advice, they would be available to give us technical advice. Uh, if we wanted to go that route. We uh, did eliminate a daycare center, uh, obviously, because it's uh, pretty close to uh, the water and uh, a potentially damaging noise from the foghorn. And we eliminated a senior citizen center because it was pro not viewed as the best use for the facility because it limits uh, the uh, public access. We're still looking at the conference facilities and some type of housing. Uh, on the one half of the keeper's quarters, uh, we felt, and still do feel, uh, must be occupied at all times so that uh, we've got to somewhere along the line come to some uh, type of uh, arrangement for the town to set up uh, uh, living facilities on one side. And we don't have to do this right off because the current chief who's in charge of the light station is not going to retire until May of 1990, and he wants to retire from Portland Headlights, so we have no, no rush on that. And when we want the other side of the quarters, the Coast Guard has informed us that they'll uh, move, the, uh, move the other keeper out whenever we want the other side so that we, we can take our time and do the job right and, uh, and, and decide what we want to do. Uh, on the side that we will keep, which I presume at this point probably will be the north side because the sun goes around the south side and it's a better place to live permanently. Uh, there are four rooms on the first floor which could be uh, uh, fixed up for a uh, type of histor historical displays. And on the second floor, there's a uh, bathroom and uh, a couple of bedrooms and so forth, which could be remodeled into some type of a conference center, which uh, we need very desperately. Uh, then if you go down to the bottom of that page, you'll see that uh, the question of operating costs came up. And we were very pleasantly surprised when uh, Clint Blood and Nancy Jackson came back with the figures uh, between $5,500 uh, $7, annually to uh, maintain the keeper's quarters. Uh, so that it's, it's not, a, not an excessive tax burden whatsoever. Then if you turn to the, la the next page, you'll see that at the bottom there, we've listed the tasks. And as you can see, there is still a lot of work to be done. Uh, we've got to still identify existing nonprofit groups that might, want, might be interested in uh, 
exhibits there. We've got to explore creating a new nonprofit group. We want to meet with the Maine Historical Preservation Commission at Earl Shuttleworth. Uh, we want to define and get more a definitive responsibility from the Coast Guard. Uh, we've got to get copies of the Coast Guard standards of rehabilitation, and we've got to uh, identify and estimate the modifications and restorations we want to do inside. And then on the last page, we uh, are going to set up a meeting with the Board of uh, uh, Historical Preservation Advisors and, uh, and review the, pro the project with them. Uh, then also attached to it, you'll see the letter that the Chief of Police wrote to Jim Cox uh, concerning the security at Portland Headlight. Uh, most of the Fort Williams Advisory Commission is here, and if you people have any questions, I, we, we <laughs> would be glad to field them if we can. Uh, as I said, this is a preliminary report, and we felt that uh, we would like to bring it to your attention so that if we're going madly down the wrong railroad track, we'd like to, uh, like to know. But if we're in, headed in the right direction, we'd like to know that also. Thank you, Thank Mr. You very Chairman. Much. Appreciate that. The way, if uh, my fellow counselors would, would uh, indulge me, I'd like to kind of handle this one is if, if we could, if there's any questions for Henry or any of the committee members, I'd like to have questions and then if there's comments, have that first. But while, while Henry's up here and while other members of the Fort Williams Advisory are out there, I'd like to break it down into, into that way. So are there any questions first for Henry or any of the members of the Fort Williams Advisory? <laughs> Councilor Amaro. How many letters did you get? 21. Uh, 21 letters? And they were all opposed to yeah. any kind of national music? Yes. Yeah, I have them, I have them right here. I, I wanted to ask, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Henry, also you mentioned here it was a unanimous opinion uh, with respect to citizens of Cape Elizabeth that all were opposed to any type of commercial uh, or profit making use of the facility. Uh, where, okay, where, well, yes. Uh, we can't, if, as far as, we can't use it for, for profit. We can use it for money. For, to defray expenses. Uh, it's, it's written right in the Coast Guard uh, 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 rules and right in the, uh, in their, probably will be written into their lease that uh, uh, we cannot use the facilities for profit, but we can use it for uh, monetary re return, which will help in turn to, uh, to keep the place up. <coughs> That'll be part of the, the deal when we sign the lease. So, th so there are some stipulations on the gift in that sense. Yeah. Well, well, we, of course, we haven't seen what the final, how, the, you know, you, you gotta, you, we're going to have to wait till the final moment to see how this thing turns out. I'm, you know, I'm not sure whether it'll be a license or, uh, or whether it'll be a lease. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be a long-term lease, could be, uh, they could license us, and uh, it depends what their real estate office on Governor's Island finally uh, determines. Will we have an opportunity, uh, Mr. Chairman, just to uh, review the Coast Guard as well as the Maine Historical Preservation Society's uh, rules, at least so that we had all an opportunity to interpret them in that regard? Yeah, I'm sure we will get, as, as soon as you have them, we'll be getting them. Or do you, you don't have them right now, do you? No. No, but it, yes, we will have the opportunity as we go about making this decision, sure. I, I wanted to just follow up on that for a minute. You're, you're not saying in the recommendation that no component would could be a gift shop. In other words, if there was even if it was a local museum, there's been the idea thrown about of having a gift shop or somewhere where people could come and get purchase a memento or some mementos. You're not you're not in this report eliminating that whole idea, are you? You're just saying you don't want it as a hundred percent gift shop or consignment shop or rental housing. That's right. And then then it well it depends on it depends on what arrangements are made uh, with whom whomsoever uh, develops a museum. Now, if Body X comes forward and they've got 10 people and they want to have a, a, uh, a uh, run a museum, nonprofit museum there, maybe the stipulations that they'll have postcards for sale for the people that come in, uh, that's something we'll have to uh, address. But right now, we don't intend to take the garage, for instance, and open it up for a wholesale place to, to sell uh, plates and keychains and all of that kind of stuff. I mean, uh, I don't want to take any business away from uh, Cape 
uh, the Cape Cottage uh, post office. Here. But you're not you're not closing the door. In other words, just for clarification of any no, of any. No shop. door. No door will be closed until our final report. Okay. And then it'll be opened up by the council. <laughs> yes. Mr. Chairman. Yes. I have a question, Henry. This was the first I'd been aware that there could be funds from the Coast Guard for restoration of the interior. Yeah, they they did they did say, and I heard them quite definitely say they would they would help restore a room to any period that we wanted it restored. In other words, if we want to go back to the old salt with his clay pipe, and then we try to get the best. Uh, information available, and would be, he would re they would assist in restoring to that. They they want the Coast Guard is very 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 uh, happy that the town is is getting these quarters. Uh, they're very very happy to help us, and they're going to turn those quarters over to us in tip top shape. We've got to make decisions on the, the aluminum siding has got to come off. They've got to go. Bef they have got to go to the main historical. Uh, Preservation Committee, Earl Shettleworth, and decide what the outside siding will be. Uh, the roof used to be green way back in the late 39s and 40s. Uh, people like Art Hahn will have to change all their uh, watercolors <laughs> if the roof becomes green. But those are the things that have got to be settled. And then when we, then we decide we want a room inside uh, back to 1898 or, or something, uh, they, they'll help us do that. They, wa they want to do that. They, they, they want to keep the place. They want to display their, their wares there, too, and they have a lot to display. Are there other questions? I would, I'd like to, I guess from reading this, you're still in the process of making a decision about security. I mean, Chief Pickering's answer yep. to you was, was very interesting. He basically broke it down in terms of four types of security. You know, I think some of which are eliminated just by common sense and yeah. it seems to be evolving, but that's something you're still studying. Mm -hmm. But I we're get. still studying it because we have, uh, it, it, it's come down to one, one fact uh, that we know, someone's got to live there. There's, there's got to be a presence of, uh, of a family living in, in one side of, of, the, uh, of the keeper's quarters because to leave it at dusk and close the front gate, we're just, we're just inviting trouble. So that, uh, how that's going to be done, we, that's why I say it's going to be late fall before we ever get a final report because there, all of these things have got to be examined. And we're, and we're, and we're under no, no rush to get it done because the people are living there and we want to take our time and, and, and do it properly. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yes, Council Jordan. Out of all those letters that you got, with they speak specifically of a national lighthouse museum? Well, I could. You haven't got to go through one, but. I'd like to read, did read you all get 21 if you'd like me to. No, I don't want you to read <laughs> 21 or no. even one. But what I'm trying to find out is any of them against, did you get the feeling out of the letters of having a small place like you just said a minute ago, the Coast Guard wants to put their wares in there and so people, and is it so people can see them? Yes. So a, it would be a local type museum affair. Yeah. Was there any of those letters against that? No. Okay. So, well, yes, there were. Yes, I, I got a couple that feel that no matter what we do down in Fort Williams, we're going to increase the use. But we've come to the conclusion that Portland Headlight is there, and people are going to go see it. And if there's a room, then maybe they'll take five more minutes and run through and look at stuff and run out. Uh, so that uh, a small Coast Guard museum and a place for Fort Williams memorabilia and things of that nature, or a period room, just so they can see what the lighthouse used to look like. It, they won't, I don't think we're going to keep people there for hours on end. Can we put your two monuments that's in I, the back of the room down there? Yeah, I was hoping that we'd find a place for those some, someday, <sighs> unless Thank the town you. manager wants them for paperweights. <laughs> Are there other questions at this juncture? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, for your excellent report and summary. And, and again, please, I want to again say how much we appreciate Nancy Jackson's effort. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd like to now ask my fellow counselors if there are comments. 
that they would like to make? Because I have some that I, w I care to make at this juncture, but if I would like to give others the opportunity to make theirs. Councilor uh, Amro. I'm really pleased to see that the Fort Williams Committee is hoping to have some uh, permanent resident or somebody living in part of that uh, keeper's quarters. Seems to make sense for uh, lots of reasons, particularly security, but also uh, to keep the, uh, the facility used. Uh, I'm glad that you're looking into uh, that aspect of it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Council Cogshaw. I just want to compliment the committee on, on, on the, just the preliminary report, how thorough and extensive it is, and I, I don't think you're going to leave a stone unturned as far as the possibility. Very good job. Council Greenlaw. I'd like to echo Phyllis's comments. I was very impressed with the report, and also will commend Nancy Jackson. <laughs> I think you must have done a great job. <laughs> if you can stand any more praise in one evening, <laughs> Nancy. It was very pleasurable to read through this. Um, when I was serving, I'm serving on the appointments committee with Jane Amro and Wayne Creelman, and I took it as part of the appointments process to question people about Fort Williams, <laughs> as Jane and Wayne will attest, and dragged out the appointments process a bit. And just told people it was an informal discussion to help me as a counselor with some of the upcoming decisions on the fort. I was hearing much the same tone that we heard at the public forum that the Fort Williams Commission had in November and did not hear a large groundswell of support for a National Lighthouse Museum. Those people who are interested in any kind of museum at, in that building were interested in something locally oriented. And I'm personally pleased to see that's the thrust of the committee's efforts at this point. Comments were also made about having, a, having somebody live there. I'm very glad that you explained about the weekend getaway. I wasn't quite sure what that was in the report. It was nice to have that clarified. You might want to reconsider that. Um, and I personally would like to um, have you continue pursuing the possibility of conference space at that facility. I think that would be a very optimal use of the space that we have available coming up there. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Jordan. I would like to <clears throat> also thank the committee, and I'm I'm going to uh, thank Nancy Jackson also <laughs> for a tremendous job. I'm glad to see some. But the next time, make sure the manager gives me a top copy because mine is faded, so I have to get the light just right to see it. So <laughs> I, as you get older, your eyes get fade away a little bit. And uh, there's one thing I did see in your report that. Uh, you mentioned a week, somebody there a week, and I would think, I think somebody should live there. If you're going to keep the place up, I 100% for that. And I don't know who it was reading the police report, the police department, they kind of like to have a place, by the way, I understand Pickering's letter. And uh, there's everybody, I think, wanting it, but I think we really do need to find somebody, and not anybody going in and out. You can't have that because everybody's moving, they all have different things they want. And uh, I think it's something that will work. Uh, Maybe some people would like it in the winter and some would like it in the summer, I don't know. But the wind and the rain gets pounding against her in the winter, maybe they wouldn't want to be there, but some people would put up with it. But it is a, it is an excellent report and keep up the good work and keep your eyes open and ears open for a mini museum. Very good, thank you, Councilor. Other comments, Councilor Amber? Yeah, I just can't resist because I know two of the uh, members of the Fort Williams Committee are going to be leaving the committee very shortly, but I, I want to uh, commend uh, both of you for, for the work uh, that you've done on the committee. And also just to mention that this year uh, during the appointments process, there were several people who have served on the Fort Williams Committee in the past who had a renewed interest because of all of the publicity that's been in the paper lately. Uh, and that. Uh, if we had chosen to do so, we could have reappointed people to the Fort Williams Committee who had served many uh, years and served very well on the Fort Williams Committee. But we felt it, that it was important to, uh, while keeping some older members on the committee who had served for a long time, to, to bring in new people too and to keep a balance on that committee. So uh, 
I hope that uh, you all will understand that through the appointments process and that uh, I think it's important for the rest of the residents in town to know too that we do have an open process that, that we do want to encourage as many people in town as possible to participate and that if, and if that we are constantly always reappointing the same people who have a strong interest in one committee to that committee that will never get uh, that, uh, the turnover that we think is healthy. And so that we hope that you people who are leaving the committee, however, will continue your interest and, and will uh, go to committee meetings every now and then and, and make sure that your views are heard. And I'm sure that you will. <laughs> I charge $100 myself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's been training grant. Thank you, Councillor. <laughs> Thank you. Other, any other comments? Uh, in that case, I'd like to make my comments regarding uh, the report, and I'd like to start off by thanking the Fort Williams Advisory Committee, and I'll be darned if I'm not going to thank Nancy Jackson, too. <laughs> Nancy. <laughs> the statue is being built soon. Um, I also want to state that I like the format of the preliminary project plan, triple P as I call it. I think it's, it's very well laid out in terms of a game plan to attack, and specifically your need to identify certain nonprofit organizations and a criteria to develop in order to judge the nonprofit organizations that may well run that facility irregardless of what it comes to be. I do have uh, two suggestions and a comment that I'd like to make at this point. It has been discussed that someone from either the Fort Williams Advisory Committee or the Town Council or a combination thereof go and visit other such facilities that have already been converted from Coast Guard uh, to public use facilities. Some people that I know, some, some projects that I've heard of in our region, and when I say our region, I mean uh, the Northeast, have done some very creative things in terms of s turning their lighthouses into public use that have fit beautifully into their communities. As a matter of fact, as, as Henry and Billy will attest when uh, Admiral Rybecki invited us for breakfast down at the Coast Guard Station for our long talk about how we would actually go through the mechanisms of turning it over to the town, he mentioned Mo Montauk Point at the end of Long Island as having a very interesting uh, public use as well as Block Island and he strongly suggested that we go to those and take a look around. So I'm hoping that some on-site inspection on this uh, could still be considered and I think, it would, I think it would be very valuable. The second su suggestion that I have is tied to comments regarding a conclusion that has already been made and is brought forward in this report. I'd like to see us further refine and develop concepts that are associated with A, B, C, and D um, in terms of potential uses, and I'll read them again for the citizens that, that may have forgotten them. A is National Lighthouse Museum, B is Local Historic Exhibit, C is Period Restoration Exhibit, and D is Coast Guard Museum. <coughs> I'd like to see us refine and develop these four concepts and not eliminate from further study the idea of the National Lighthouse Museum. After fur further refining and developing these concepts, I'd like to see us do a comprehensive polling of our citizens in, in some professional format. What I mean by that is we have worked with the University of Southern Maine. There are other nonprofit professional polling organizations that can help us with wording and with the mechanisms for polling to ensure objectivity and to ensure a broader based results regarding four concepts that I think could come forward, be developed, and then uh, be, ask the citizenry in a, more, in a more professional polling manner what they think of those four concepts. To me, this would give a much more representative sampling of what people are thinking about clearly detailed proposals, and I do underline that, clearly detailed proposals, because most, it's most difficult <coughs> to react to an idea when it hasn't been spelled out exactly what is meant by that idea. And this is the problem that I have right now with the rejection of the National Lighthouse Museum. What does that mean? It means different things to different people. And we don't have a consensus, nor do we have a definition of what that means, nor do we have a consensus of definition of what the others mean either. So what I'm saying is I'd like to see them all further developed and then have some type of polling apparatus, even if it's through the Cape Courier, even if it's through a mailing we do ourselves, or through USM, or through whatever way we could to get, to get ideas about that. There's no one in town that wants a big museum. And, and suddenly and unfortunately, national has become synonymous with the word big. And I'm just saying it simply does not have to be that way. Would people of Cape Elizabeth accept a museum that had a national component to it that was totally appropriate in size for our Fort William facility that would cost the taxpayers nothing and in fact could be an income generator to help op offset other Fort Williams expenses? I don't know. I think it would be interesting to find out. Would the people of Cape Elizabeth accept a museum 
that had a national component to it, if that meant a far greater educational benefit for our children by having new exhibits from around the country that would change monthly rather than establishing a static museum that would basically be the same year in and year out. So what I'm, what I'm basically suggesting is that it's simply premature to do a wholesale rejection at this juncture of concept A. The potential benefit, as I see it and as I have a vision, of an appropriate scaled museum with a national component to it could be extremely beneficial, could be extremely enormously beneficial for, for our citizens. As such, I think we should further refine that idea, not give up on it, and refine it in a way that's appropriate to Cape Elizabeth. And this is what I want to emphasize, appropriate to that facility and appropriate to Cape Elizabeth. And then put that out as part of an overall wider poll. To me, it's, it's an idea that I think is important and has tremendous educational and cultural benefits, potential benefits for our citizens, and it deserves more studies along with B, C, and D as, as I've defined earlier. I've done a lot of talking with citizens over the last few months. I've gone to different people's houses and, and, and I've just point blank asked what is the general consensus. What I'm sensing from numerous people that I've talked to is that they have an open mind about it. That they're waiting for us as the leaders along with the Fort Williams Advisory Committee to come forward with further refinements, further clarifications, further definitions of some of the different ideas and then they'd like to have some input into further clarification. That's what I'm getting, specifically in numerous people I've talked to over the weekend and, and even before that. So I hope because of the import of this that we, that we be fair and keep our minds open to A, to a refining of A. I really believe on behalf of the citizens that it deserves further study. And, and I want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to comment. And those are my comments regarding uh, that particular component of the uh, proposal that came forward. Are there any further comments regarding the Fort Williams Advisory report? If not, would someone care to make a Mr. motion? Chairman? Oh, yes. yes. Um, equal time, I guess. And <laughs> I've heard tonight Chairman Henry Adams of Fort Williams Commission talk about conversations they've had with a representative of the National Lighthouse Museum. I heard him describe the size requirements of a National Lighthouse Museum is something that, in my mind, says big if, if the current keeper's quarters were not big enough. If those aren't big enough and it's something bigger than you can addition to that building or something, to me, that's big. That's the definition, description given by that organization. I don't feel necessarily that a local, locally oriented museum or a Coast Guard oriented museum has to be a static display. I think efforts can certainly be made to see that such a museum does not have static displays. That's good museum policy, which I'm sure would be followed. And I want to be very careful that this town council does not undermine the efforts of a committee and the committee process that, to my mind, this town council has always found very important. I want to be very careful with any steps we take relative to this issue. If that doesn't happen. Councilor Hammer? Yeah, I'd just like to follow up on both of your comments. Frank, I think you and I must talk to different people because I have not talked to one person in town who is interested in having a national museum at, the, at uh, Fort Williams. Uh, <clears throat> so I, I think that the letters that uh, the committee has already received, plus the public hearing, gives a pretty good sample of how people in town are thinking. And certainly it is a small sample, but as we all know, uh, a, lot of, uh, uh, a lot can be gleaned from, from a very small <coughs> sample. So I, I would agree with Janet. I don't want to force the Fort Williams committee uh, into any kind of a stance, but I'd like to see them go through the process uh, that they planned and uh, then bring our recommendations forward and then we can deal with them at that time. But with that, I'd, li I'd like to move at this time uh, acknowledge acknowledgement of receipt of this report. Sure. Second a motion. Just mm -hmm. one comment, mm -hmm. if I may. You may. Uh, I don't know if you two girls have a, have a good point in what they present, what the report has presented, but I don't think it's wrong to have your ears opened on something else that might come down the line if you don't really know what it is, to strike it right out, period, right now, without 
listening to it, I think it's the wrong way to go. Listen, you don't know how big it's going to be. Could have small ones, big ones, indifferent. And there might be a way you can work a small one in with someone else, like uh, Councilor Tory says, that, uh, and move some stuff around and have some new stuff once in a while. I think you're going to listen to everything before you flat say no right at this point. I know people out there, who, they don't want a big national deal where the buses come in by the bus loads day after day, two or three times a day and things like that, but there's a certain amount of bus loads that come in there already. So what harm is having, letting them mill through a small place? And I think you've got to have your ears open for anything. you got a year or so now to work on it. Thank you, Councillor. I'd also like to just make a clarification in terms of Mr. Schnacki. He, from my questioning him again recently as this week, basically stated that he didn't believe that a National Lighthouse Museum could fit into the, the property exclusively. And he never meant to imply that he would suggest adding on to that building because that's thoroughly inappropriate and everyone in town would not be in favor of that. There are other buildings at Fort Williams, however, that he felt could be added on to as part of a National Museum. So part of it, in other words, the centerpiece, the focal point would be down at the Keeper's Quarters. Others would be located in other buildings that are located in Fort Williams. So I just wanted to, for the record, clarify that. I also want to speak to the fact that being that a major recommendation has come forward at this juncture and we've been invited to comment on it, I think it's the totally appropriate time for me to state what I did. They have basically said they are no longer pursuing the National Lighthouse idea and I believe in, in good conscience this is the time for councils that are still favor that or favor the study of it further to speak up on it. And the only other thing I would like to say in, uh, at the possible sake of being slightly redundant is it's unfortunate that there are those who are stating already opposition or hard fast to a national museum when we haven't even discussed what the town consensus on that is. I might do a presentation on what I envision as a national museum, limited scope, appropriate to scale, uh, which has tremendous educational benefits for the citizenry that may be accepted by a, ma a majority of people after I presented a half hour presentation. So this is what I'm asking, to be careful of the pitfall. What are people talking about? Are we talking apples to apples or apples to oranges here? And uh, I, think, I think it could be a dangerous way to conduct public policy to some degree unless we're a little bit more clear on what we're all agreeing to rejecting or accepting. And that's, again, I, I thank you for your indulgence in letting me make those comments. Any other comments? If not, we have a Ready motion the on the question. floor. Ready for the question. All those in favor of accepting the report as presented, please raise your hands. Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Thank you once again for all your efforts. And Good luck as you continue on the path. I'd like to ask for a five-minute recess, if we could, and uh, then move on to our next agenda item. Oh, she's still Fort Williams. Is that recess? Oh, yeah. We, would you like to do uh, the last Fort Williams? I think we yeah. Why don't we do that? Okay. Before we recess, we have item 95, which is also appropriate to the Fort Williams advisory. So we, w we would take that up at this time, which is to consider updating the Fort Williams. Park special events fee policy and take any necessary action. I'd ask Michael to do a little introduction. Uh, the town council here at a recent meeting discussed the, the policy uh, regarding the statement of uses of Fort Williams and particularly the fees that are charged for that. Uh, subsequent to that, in, at a workshop, uh, I believe uh, on January 6th, we reviewed the policy and we were asking to make several changes, some of which are uh, grammatical corrections and others. Uh, are uh, a little more substantive. Uh, on one page, it just makes it clear that it's the council that sets fees and not the town manager. Uh, there was some confusion uh, about uh, that particular topic. Uh, previously, the policy stated that all money collected under the policy uh, would be utilized uh, at the direction of the Fort Williams Committee for making improvements within Fort Williams. Uh, in keeping with other town policies, as a recommended amendment uh, that all money collected under the policy would accrue to the general fund for overall municipal use and reduction of uh, property taxes. Uh, there was also uh, the formally stated that uh, either the Fort Williams com uh, Committee Commission or the Town Council could change the policy at any time. Uh, every other policy in town goes through a procedure and, and the Council is the, the policy making body in town and it's, it's more appropriate uh, that the Council have the ultimate say in any change. So it was a recommended uh, Amendment this that would provide the town council may amend this policy any time after consultation with the Fort Williams Advisory Commission. This was circulated uh, to the Fort Williams Advisory Commission. Uh, 
they received a copy of it. Very good. Is there any comments? Yes, Council. I would just like to ask the town manager if instead of having the money um, accrue to the general fund, if it could go into a sub-account in the general fund, so we'll have some <coughs> idea of how much income is generated through these fees, or do you have a way of already keeping track of that without having an actual sub-account? We keep track of that with sub-accounts all the So we could very easily put our finger on the amount? Yes, sir. Okay. Other comments? Council Green? I move that we approve the revised policies submitted. I'll second. Been moved and seconded to approve the uh, updated policies. Any other comments? Council Jordan? One comment. Maybe I don't understand it. I don't know. But I read it, and I thought the council was the one to set the fees. But I read this. This policy statement empowers the Fort Williams Advisory Commission to set such fees as, as applied based, based on the following fee structure. Now, that doesn't mean that they set the fees in. Yes. I, the way this policy ha has been from the beginning is that you establish the basic fee structure. They choose among those ors. If you notice, every one of those clauses, A, B, C, D, and D, and or, yeah. uh, they choose among the ors. Why is that? Just the way it was set up. Uh, Basically, you know, because there are different types of activities, and in each activity, there's, there's a different ability uh, to collect revenue in, in terms of whether or not, for example, it's a lot of vehicles, uh, you collect a fee that way. If it's something you're going to get a lot of pedestrians in, more so, you, you're, you're more likely to put it uh, based on a per person fee. Uh, there are some things like 5% of gross ticket sales, that's a possibility. Uh, something that is, uh, you know, that they charge a quarter for. To, to go to, you might not want to do that, but if it was like a $10 a ticket fee thing, the 5% uh, might be deemed to be appropriate. And a lot of those, you know, you give the ini initial concept of approval to an activity, that activity changes tremendously uh, over the course of many months. I think we're dealing with this with the Lighthouse Preservation Society uh, weekend now. That proposal continues to evolve that weekend. So, you know, that the Fort Williams Committee looks at it and they determine, you know, which of the oars uh, ought to take precedence. But within the fee structure, policy is adopted by the council. So the, the council is really the one that approves the, uh, the functions as far as the port, port goes, isn't it? That's the general concept. But then once you do approve them, uh, they do uh, sometimes take a, a different form than when they were first proposed. Uh, for, and I think the Lighthouse Preservation Weekends are, is, is a good example of that. That program continues to evolve every day. Well, I don't, I don't want to take any power away from the group over there, but I would think if the council sets the fees, the council should be the ones to set it up and have it defined on how they're going to charge and not leave it up to a committee to, for either or or but which way they want to do it. Yeah, the council adopts this policy, and you know, if, if you if you want to, uh, you know, have them make make a recommendation to you, you know, that's within the definitely within the uh, right of the council to do so. Well, I would think that is uh, is uh, power of the commission is to recommend to the council how it's done, and how it's going to be charged, and not leave it open ended to what they feel is the way they want to do it for different events. I think each event should be charged accordingly, and if another one comes in similar to it, it should be charged, and I don't see why that couldn't be done in black and white. Is that an amendment? Or? It, yes. it seems to me that the town council has already empowered the, the advisory committee to do this as of July 14, 1986. It, it appears that we would need a motion to revoke that empowering if we wanted to amend this policy. Would we not? I, I agree with you. Okay. Could I speak to that? Sure. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> That's why we kept you here. <laughs> <laughs> I think the, I don't want you to uh, miss the point. The Fort Williams Advisory Commission is taking a load off of your people's shoulders. These people come in and explain to the Fort Williams Advisory Commission 
exactly what they want to use the fort for, how they intend to finance what they're doing, and we listen to their presentation, and then from the fee schedule, we set a fee, which is agreeable to them uh, and agreeable to us. And then we make a recommendation to the town council that uh, you authorize item X to use the fort, and we can add to that uh, at a dollar per vehicle or 25 cents per, per person. See, right now, as, as uh, Mr. McGovern has mentioned, uh, this Lighthouse Preservation Society Celebration 200 is changing constantly. And uh, right now, we've established with them that the vehicles that enter will be a dollar per vehicle, but they're also talking right now about busing people in from some holding area outside of the town. And we have said then if you bus people in, there'll be 25 cents per person in the bus. So, I mean, we, we, we're, we're taking all of this discussion away from you people so you don't have to worry about this. And then we make a recommendation to the council as to, uh, as to what we feel you ought to do. And I think the wording there, we set the fee, maybe, maybe we could change the word to set the fee to recommend the fee if that would satisfy you. But uh, this is what we're doing anyway. I mean, we really don't have the authority to, to make decisions for the council. But we, we do listen to the whole, the whole presentation that people make and then uh, come up with a decision for you people. I would, I would just say personally, I don't, I don't have any problem with it because what we've done is set the parameters for you and then you are simply telling us what you feel is the, or we're giving you the choice to say what's the most appropriate. I think if you came forward and said, we're gonna decide how much to charge and et cetera, that would be inappropriate, but we have set, as the council has set the parameters, all they're doing is making the decision as to which, which are applicable, yeah. and I think in the past they've proven to be totally helpful in that, so I, I don't see any problems with the way it's set up. If I may. Sorry to disagree, Councilor. I know, I like people to disagree with me because <laughs> a lot of them always do. <laughs> but in working on the audience committee, and I miss my little gal sitting there on my left because she's a, a word processor uh, <laughs> as far as we get going. And I think she would, would be on my side for once. That we, <laughs> <laughs> that we change that instead of set such fees to recommend such fees. And uh, I would like to offer a motion to, oh, excuse me, to recommend to Amendment to the motion to change the word from set to recommend. Would would Second. implicit would implicit be behind that that um, they would be recommending to the council that we then have to vote on, at every function as to whether or not we approved what they recommended? Uh, just 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 for clarification. In other words, they're going to recommend that it's going to come as an agenda item for the Porsche Club. We recommend this, and then we vote on it. We have to approve when. PSO wants the dates, and I presume that when we approve that, the fees are set when they have set down together. We have to approve when, uh, other than the use of the, uh, the shelter, which is done by the manager, but anybody that comes in here to use a fort of any size, the council approves the use of it and the dates. And I would say the fees would be set at that time. Are the fees yeah, right? on our on our recommendation? Yes, Councilor Cox. I would interpret that as meaning that every time an event is going to be held, that we would have to actually approve which of these um, fees or processes you went through, and I think they're much closer to the activity and the discussion. That in the past it's worked very well, that they actually set the fees. And an excellent example right now is this, this um, development of the celebration of the lighthouse. They still aren't sure really what's happening. And to be actually be able to set a fee has been an impossibility to this date. And we've already approved the actual date of the event. I think it's much more efficient since we've given them the mechanism to let them because they're the closest to the whole process, actually set the fee and leave it as it's written. 
I also think another fallback position is if we study over a period of a year or something when all the faces and names have changed on the Fort Williams Advisory and we're not, we see a consistent pattern that we're not pleased with the fees that are being set, we could hold a workshop or we could say what's, what's happening or we don't like, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm saying we don't have no fallback, we do have a fallback position, so that's something else to consider. Yes, Council. <coughs> My understanding of the policy is that any time uh, the Council uh, receives a recommendation by the Fort Williams Advisory uh, Committee that uh, we basically um, authorize the use of the fort for a particular occasion and in that uh, authorization we agree with what fee uh, has been set. If at any point we disagree, uh, we can amend the fee as a council at that particular time, looking to precedents that have been set previously. So I'm not, uh, I, I don't think that needs to be changed personally. Okay, so I believe oh, just one more. Jordan, yes. But as far as the use of the fort for the lighthouse preservation and what have you, and it spells out right here, if the buses come in, it's a certain fee. The vehicles come in, it's a certain mm -hmm. fee. So it's all spelled right out for them, unless they want to negotiate something else down below. And I think it's spelled out for as far as the use of the fort right here, right now, and it should be a recommendation. I think we had an amendment. I'm just checking my parliamentary procedure here. I think we had an amendment in that was seconded by Councilor Cogshaw. Was that right? Nobody. No. Council by Amber. Okay. So it's been moved and seconded to amend. Uh, uh, let's see. Basically, what the word set to recommend. Right. Okay. Any further discussion on the amendment? If not, all those in favor of the amendment, please raise your hand. All opposed. So the amendment fails to carry. Moving back to the original motion, all those in favor of the original motion, please raise your hand. All opposed? Gee, you could have blocked it if everybody voted the same way, but sure. we didn't, and on we go. They went. So I we don't know where they went. I don't know where they went on. They left me hanging. Where'd they go? All right, so we have approved the uh, Fort William usage. And we thank, once again, the Fort Williams Advisory Committee for coming. I would like to now call a five-minute recess, and we'll be back to talk about the budget impact schedule as proposed by the town manager in five minutes. We stand in recess. <laughs>